We're so glad that we are so glad that uh, we've got. Looks like we've got seventy folks that have joined us already today, and uh, so welcome, welcome to Forest Herd, North Carolina's Enjoying Your Woods workshop. This is the third workshop, the third and final workshop, we should say, of this series, and uh, we've got two great speakers on board with us today very knowledgeable and we look forward to hearing what they have to say today. My name is Jennifer Roach. I am a district forester with the North Carolina Forest Service and uh, I'll be trying to moderate this today and and uh, and if I interrupt our speakers I apologize but we'll try to keep everybody on the time frame so that uh, we don't hold you up too much more so you can get outside and enjoy this beautiful spring afternoon. All right, well, before we go uh, at Forest, or before, before we move forward, uh, Forrester, we love to chat. We love to enter, to connect. And uh, the virtual meetings, of course, are, are a little difficult for us to do that and sit around and, and share stories. And uh, usually we ask for folks to type in the chat box and tell us where you're from, where you're joining us today. Uh, but maybe I think today might be a great time, a great opportunity for folks to tell us, uh, what are you excited about seeing in the woods this spring? What is it that you're excited about getting out and as you walk through your property or your woodlot or in your yard, you know, what are you looking forward to see? Um, have you planted some young pine trees and you're, you're waiting for spring to come and for the grasses and the trees to start growing? Uh, are you looking for a particular hardwood tree that you like to see bloom every year? Um, or do you love prefer wildflowers? Are you out looking to see what comes up in an area or are you planted some warm season grasses? Uh, just excited to get outside and work in the yard or the dirt? Just let us know. Put that in the chat box. But if the chat box, if we're not real sure, we do have some new folks joining us. So we wanna make sure that everyone out there can, can communicate, can talk back and forth with us. So we do have Bob Barden, who was with NC State Forestry Extension, and he is on the line and he's gonna kind of walk us through how we can connect and interact during this virtual meeting. Hey, Bob. Thank you, Jennifer. So as Jennifer said, uh, with we're using Zoom, as you all uh, have already discovered by joining today's session. Uh, you can participate with this webinar in a couple different ways. Uh, if you're having technology issues or if you're answering something that the uh, presenter has prompted you to, you can do that in the chat box. And many of you have discovered that. And it's uh, amazing to see where people are from and what they're waiting to see uh, as we move into spring this year. I, like other people, I really do enjoy seeing the wildflowers that are starting to come up and uh, red buds that are starting to bloom and, and those type of things. Uh, to also to participate today, if you get a question as the presenters uh, um, speaking today, there's a Q&A feature in Zoom and you'll see a little icon there at the bottom of your screen at the bottom of the Zoom window. If you click on that icon, we ask you then to type in your questions into that feature. This way we can keep the questions separated from the chat. That way we'll be more likely not to miss somebody's question um, if they put it in the chat versus that Q&A feature. We are doing closed captioning. And so if you uh, are a person that needs that service, uh, feel free to click on that closed caption icon um, so that you'll see it. It will scroll against the bottom of the screen. If you need to get our attention for any reason and we're not catching what you said in the chat, uh, go ahead and click on raise your hand. That's also an icon you'll see there at the bottom of your screen. And that will also help us to get your attention. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jennifer. All right, thank you, Bob. Yeah, it is, uh, it's great to see in the chat some of the things that our, our folks on the meeting today are excited to see. Uh, a lot of folks are looking forward to mushroom hunting, so that's good to see. Um, just make sure you know what you're looking for before. <laughs> make sure you know the difference uh, of what's edible. I, for one, am not that person, so uh, that always kind of makes me nervous, so I'm glad that there's a lot of folks out there that are, are great with uh, mushrooms and medicinal plants and edible 
edible things of the forest. So some great things to see and a lot of things happening as spring starts to bloom. All right. Well, uh, without further ado, we will keep moving forward. So you can see the agenda today. We will start our first speaker. We'll be talking about enjoying your woods safely. And that is Kelly Douglas, who is with the United States Department of Agriculture in Wildlife Services. So uh, Kelly, if you want to take it away. You hear me all right, Jennifer? Yes, sound great. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, since we're starting at 106, Jennifer, I'm going to try to keep an eye on the time, but feel free to cut me off if I need to. Um, hopefully, that'll give me a couple more minutes. I have a lot of a lot of information prepared for you guys today. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing Jennifer's screen and start sharing mine. There we go. Can you guys see that all right? Yes, that looks good. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Um, well, as Jennifer said, uh, my name is Kelly Douglas. I'm actually a wildlife disease biologist with USDA Wildlife Services. Um, I used to work with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, so a lot of the names I recognize in the chat box are um, potentially a, a landowner that I worked with when I was doing habitat management. Um, so anyway, I know I've seen you guys with a lot of some of the returns from uh, our Forest Her workshops last year uh, before we had to go virtual, so it's nice to see everybody again. Um, but I'm going to jump right in in the interest of time here. <clears throat> so I just want to qualify that this, uh, you know, I'm not a medical professional. I'm not a licensed physician or medical nurse or EMT or firefighter or uh, any kind of first responder. Um, but I am a wildlife biologist and I've spent my whole life living in North Carolina and I've spent my entire career working in North Carolina. So I've hiked thousands of miles in our great state and I have spent thousands of hours in multiple regions from the coast to the mountains. Um, and I've handled thousands of critters in my lifetime. So my purpose really today is to um, give you guys some tips and tricks on how I try to stay safe in the woods. So I have a really easy outline for us to follow today. I'm going to go over your top safety concerns, not my top safety concerns. Um, I'm going to go over preventing incidents and protecting yourself, ways you can do that um, against those safety concerns. And then I'm going to give you a kind of brief, brief peek inside of what I carry in my backpack. So during the registration process, uh, you guys, we asked you what your greatest safety concern was when you're enjoying the outdoors. And we were actually able to tally those answers and that helped me shape this presentation today. So you are gonna be hearing information about uh, yourself and everybody else who's joining on this uh, webinar today, what, what your responses are. We might not have gotten all of you because the registration did just close only a few minutes ago, uh, but I think we captured the vast majority of, of the responses here. Um, so this is what you guys said. Um, your top safety concerns are number one, by far, snakes. Um, people make it a good second, accident and injury are third. So I put the top three in blue just because all three of those answers had at least 20 responses or more. Um, like I said, snakes were by far, there were 55 responses of people that were concerned about snakes when you're out and about. Um, and I do realize that snakes are considered wildlife, um, but because of the overwhelming response from you guys, I wanted to go ahead and pull that out of the kind of general wildlife category and talk about that for several minutes in this presentation. Um, wildlife in general gets number four rating. There were 16 responses. Seven of those were specific to bears. So I am gonna talk about bears today in this presentation. Um, the other ones were more just in general, um, got some responses here, uh, let's see. Um, unexpected wildlife encounters, just wild animals in general. And the one I like the most is unintentionally disturbing something wild that didn't want to be disturbed, um, which is awesome. So. Uh, and then ticks, of course, were number five with 14 responses. So these are, these are the top five. Um, these are the ones I'm actually going to talk about today, just given the interest amongst everybody here. 
And then I just wanted to give you um, the kind of next, you know, six really uh, poisonous plants. There were only four responses on poisonous plants. Three of those were about poison ivy, um, but there are some other poisonous plants out there. If we have time, maybe we'll chat about that. Uh, getting lost, there were three responses there. And then the ones in brown, rabid animals, um, bramble entanglement, feral dogs, and spiders. And really spiders was actually somebody who said they were uh, concerned about running into spider webs at night, not so much the spiders themselves. So I'm not even gonna talk about this page really because there were so few responses. Um, it is very interesting to me. Uh, I'm not surprised that y'all's list is different than what my list would be just because the amount of time I've spent outside and, and uh, what I know about wildlife. Um, but I am kind of, I was a little surprised to see the order of concern. So this is, hopefully this presentation will be really useful for you guys today. But again, I'm only gonna cover one through five. Um, so snakes, people, accident injuries, wildlife, and ticks. So I tried really, really hard um, not to tell people what they should or should not be afraid of um, or what they should or should not be concerned about because everybody's different and everybody has developed different phobias and things like that over the years. Um, but what I do hope to do is to try to give you a few tips or tricks um, that could maybe help lessen some of those fears or concerns. Um, things that will hopefully allow you to become a little bit more comfortable outside so that you can enjoy your time uh, on your property or just outdoors in general. So the first one that I wanted to cover is snakes. Um, and the first, the best way that I felt to cover snakes would be trying to cover some of these myths and misconceptions. And let me tell you, there are a ton of myths and misconceptions out there about snakes, uh, snakes in general, venomous snakes, things like that. But um, I wanted to kind of go through sort of the top 10 of what I hear the most. Um, and uh, so hopefully this will this will kind of help. So number one, uh, people say snakes are naturally very aggressive and will chase after you. Um, so snakes are not at all aggressive. Um, they are defensive. You are much bigger than they are, even the smallest of you ladies out there. Um, you're, you're significantly larger than a you know two to three, four foot snake. So when they encounter you, um, a lot of times they're immediately put on the defensive, which is misperceived as being aggressive. Um, most snakes have no interest in chasing after you. Uh, you're not prey, you're not a meal. Um, they don't have any kind of uh, vengeance against you or anything like that. It's, that's not a part of their normal behavior. Um, there's probably two reasons for that part of this myth. Um, there are um, Bushmaster snakes that are in Central America that are, um, they actively do chase people. Uh, that is part of their, they, they do have that aggressive behavior. So I think, in, and they're only in Central America, they're not here by the way. Um, but I think that's part of why people just assume that every snake is gonna chase after them that this one species does. But also a lot of times when we are trying to get away from snakes, we're gonna take the path of least resistance. And sometimes the snake's path of least resistance is the exact same path as ours. And so sometimes it appears uh, that snakes will chase you. Um, I've only ever had one that acted like it was, like what I could have misperceived as chasing me. And that was a black racer. Uh, but again, it was because it was the path of least resistance for the snake to escape and me to escape. Um, as soon as it found its normal little hole down the trail where it would normally veer off because they know their territory. They, once, once it found that hole, it, it completely diverted and went the other way. So, um, but I've encountered hundreds of snakes in my entire lifetime and career. and I've never once had one actually try to chase me. Um, so number two on here, snakes are poisonous. Um, I hear this all the time. It's very pervasive and it's actually one of my biggest pet peeves as wildlife biologists. Um, snakes in general, are not poisonous. And we're gonna get into this in just a couple of slides, um, but please, please, please use the correct terminology when you're responding, responding to snakes. Um, this simply is just not true. All snakes are not venomous. There's only a handful of them that are, um, and poisonous is in almost all instances the wrong word to use. So please use venomous. Um, number three, all snakes with triangular heads and elliptical pupils are venomous. So uh, we do have six venomous snakes here in North Carolina. Five of those have triangular heads and elliptical pupils. So 
So in North Carolina, this is mostly true, uh, but we do have one venomous snake that does not have a triangular head. In fact, it doesn't look anything triangular um, and it does not have elliptical pupils. They're actually very round. Um, so this, the, and if you think about the vast majority of snake species worldwide, this doesn't really hold much credence. Um, it, it's pretty typical among rattlesnakes. So I think that's why this myth is out there. Um, so uh, let's see, number four here, snakes can only strike from a coiled position. That is not true. Snakes can strike from any position, although they can strike much farther when they're in a coiled position. Uh, in general, snakes can only strike about two thirds of the length of their body length. So, or, or the distance, they can only strike that far the length of their body. So if a snake is three feet long, um, it's only gonna be able to strike two feet away from where it's sitting. And then rattlesnakes always rattle before striking. Uh, this is not true. I've actually encountered probably a dozen rattlesnakes in my career, and I've only ever had one rattle in front of me. Um, even though I've been a handful of feet away from each of these, uh, there was only one that rattled and it was because it was almost stepped on by the gentleman that was walking in front of me on the trail. And it just rattled and slithered, slithered off into the weeds. Um, it didn't even bother striking. So rattles are really meant to be a warning. Um, it is their way of telling you to leave them alone and to go away. Um, they really do not like striking if they don't have to. And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, it's mostly venom conservation. So moving on to the next one, snakes always travel in pairs. I really don't know where this misconception came from. Um, snakes are very solitary animals. The only time you're gonna see them uh, in groups uh, is either gonna be paired up when they're mating and then they immediately separate. Um, and then, or you might potentially run across uh, a hibernaculum in the winter, especially maybe in the mountains where there's rock outcrops or caves, dens, that kind of thing. Um, but most of the time we aren't poking around in those places in the winter. Anyway, I suppose if you have really good snake habitat on your property, um, then you might see multiple snakes of the same species on the same day, which might give people this misconception, um, but it's really just not true. They're, they're very solitary creatures. Um, snakes are deaf. This one is out there because snakes do not have eardrums. They lack eardrums, but they do have inner ear structures. So they can hear, um, but they hear mostly through uh, ground vibrations and low frequency airborne sounds. Um, so again, most of it's vibrations, but they can't actually hear, they're not deaf. Snakes can't strike underwater. Uh, I just want everybody to think a minute about sea, sea snakes. Everybody's probably heard about those. They live exclusively in water um, and most of them have very difficulty traveling on land. And so if they weren't able to strike or hunt underwater, they, they would not survive. So any of our aquatic snakes uh, or semi-aquatic snakes here in North Carolina can actually strike underwater. And, and some of them like cottonmouths, um, their scientific name actually means hooked tooth fish eater. If that gives you any indication of what they typically will uh, eat and how they would hunt. So um, number four on this list, uh, baby snakes. First off, please don't call them babies. Uh, that's another one of the pet peeves of mine and, and a lot of other wildlife biologists. Uh, the term baby is used for young humans. Uh, we have lots of other terms to describe young animals. So if you think about pups or kits or kittens or chicks, that kind of thing. Uh, baby snakes are called neonates, so newborns, just another term for that, or they're called juveniles or hatchlings, just like a lot of other reptiles out there. Uh, this one, the juvenile snakes inject more venom than adults. It's actually um, it's sort of partially true. And let me explain. Um, so the venom that an adult snake has actually has a higher virulency of activity. So it's typically more potent than a juvenile snake. Um, and the adult snakes are actually capable of injecting more venom because they have more per uh, I guess body mass, if you want to think about it that way, they can actually inject more venom per bite than a juvenile snake can. So there's two reasons why that one is wrong. Um, but the one, the one kind of partial true statement here is that um, usually juvenile state snakes do not have as much control over their musculature as adults. Um, and they are also at their most vulnerable, 
vulnerable point in their lifetime. So their defense mechanisms um, are heightened usually when they're young. And so they're gonna be much more likely to strike, uh, bite hard and pump as much venom into that uh, threat as, or prey as they can, just because they kind of haven't learned to conserve that venom and only use it when necessary. So the adult snakes have been around for a long time. They've learned that if they use their venom on an object or you know a person or a mouse or whatever, um, that depletes their venom resources. And if they uh, are not careful, they can't hunt successfully without that. So um, really it's mostly, mostly the opposite on that one there. And then uh, the last one is if you see a juvenile snake, there is usually a parent nearby. Um, this is just flat out wrong. Um, snakes are not at all known for their parental care. They have uh, no kind of mothering instinct, if you want to call it that. Uh, most snakes will lay their eggs and immediately depart. And when those eggs hatch, those juveniles are left to the devices of nature. And then uh, even the live bearing species will, uh, they may stay around their offspring for maybe a day or two. Uh, I've seen a timber rattlesnake that had just given birth and she had several juveniles around her, uh, but within a day or two, those are all going to just completely go the opposite way. And, and in most situations, uh, a snake will never meet or see their offspring. Um, so parental care is just not in a snake's nature. And there's a ton more myths and misconceptions, but these are kind of the main ones that I wanted to cover because those are the ones I hear the most often. So poisonous versus venomous. I love this meme. Um, this is a great way to show the difference between the two. So poisonous, if you want to think about that, it's almost always going to be in, ingested or absorbed. So you think about poisonous plants, it's something that you brush up against uh, and you absorb whatever toxin through your skin that that plant contains, or you're going to actually bite it, eat it, ingest it. So you think about uh, poisonous berries, or you think about poisonous dart frogs, or salamanders, newts, that kind of thing that have toxins built into their skin or tissues, um, and then licking, eating, or, or consuming those things makes it poisonous. So venomous is actually, you want to think about that in injection. So there's animals like spiders and snakes, wasps and you know hornets, things like that, that actually inject you with that toxin. So they're going to bite you, they're going to sting you, um, things like that. So poisonous is ingested, venomous is injected, if you want to think about that. Now, the reason I said earlier that not all snakes are venomous is because there are a handful that are or could be considered poisonous. And there's just a handful. Um, if you think about uh, king snakes, uh, California king snakes, or um, you know eastern king snakes, we even have some of those in North Carolina. They can be considered poisonous because they are resistant to the venom of pit vipers, and so they can actually consume venomous snakes. They consume the copperhead that has the venom inside of it, and then that snake, because it's immune, doesn't have any negative effects. But if you were to uh, eat it, or if another animal were to eat a king snake, uh, it could it could actually be considered poisonous at that point because they're ingesting it. Uh, garner garter snakes, excuse me, are the same way. Newts and salamanders sometimes have some toxic properties to their skin or tissues, and because the garter snake feeds almost exclusively on um, amphibians, for the most part, they uh, can also be considered poisonous. Um, there is an example of a snake that is both poisonous and venomous. It's called the tiger keelback. It's found in Asia, uh, but all of the ones that we have in North Carolina, and by all, I mean the six that we have, um, they are all venomous. There's more than 3,000 species of snakes on the planet, and only about 12 of those, I mean 12% of those are considered venomous, and only about 7% of those are actually able to significantly injure or um, kill a human. So these are the venomous snakes of North Carolina. Again, I said we only have six. Uh, copperhead in the upper left-hand corner. Eastern coral snake, this is the one that defies, the one in the middle top is the one that defies um, that triangular head and elliptical pupil uh, myth that we hear the most about. The cottonmouth, uh, upper right, 
the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake, Timber Rattlesnake, and Pygmy Rattlesnake are the three rattlesnakes we have in North Carolina. So all five of the six of these, all of them except for the Eastern Coral Snake, uh, are considered pit vipers, which means they have these little pits right below the eye. You can see it really well in the copperhead where they can um, detect heat signatures, which helps them be more effective when they hunt. The Eastern Coral Snake um, is actually in the Cobra family, family not the pit viper family. Um, and they actually um, have a, a neurotoxin instead of a hematoxin. So nor neurotoxin obviously affects the neurological system. The hematoxin affects your circulatory system. So that's uh, the Eastern Coral Snake, sort of an individual one here in North Carolina. All the other ones are, are at least a little bit more related. So the copperhead, you can see uh, by the pictures here, they're usually coppery brown, their heads especially. Uh, they have these kind of Hershey kisses. If you look at the pattern, the brown part of their skin um, can actually look, uh, yeah, you guys might be able to see my cursor here. This brown part looks sort of like a Hershey's kiss from the side. Or if you look at the tan part, it almost looks like a saddle. So you hear both of those to describe the pattern here. Um, or if you look at it from above, which I don't have a good picture of here, it almost looks like an hourglass. So that's, that's why you hear those three um, for cross bands describing the, the description, I mean, uh, describing the pattern on copperheads. Um, the young copperheads look just like the adults, except a lot of times they will have this yellow or green tail, like the last uh, maybe inch of their tail. And that's because they actually will sit there and wiggle that little tail in the leaf litter to try to attract prey, uh, mostly just lizards, frogs, things that they can try to get within a striking distance because they're not quite as effective at hunting yet. They are, uh, copperheads usually have an average length of two and a half to three feet with a max of about four and a half feet in North Carolina. When threatened, they will usually vibrate their tail in the, in the leaves. I know some of you have probably heard that or seen that. They do release musk, just like a lot of other snakes do, but they will bite if necessary. Uh, the bite can be very painful, but it's rarely fatal to people. A lot of times that fatality or, or um, significant injury is from a secondary infection that you get from the bite wound. Um, but it is something to be cautious of because they, they can envenomate you. So eastern coral snakes, the one here in the middle, you can see uh, it can look like a lot of other species or at least several other species here in North Carolina, the scarlet king snake and scarlet snake. Um, but you can always tell the difference between an eastern coral snake and the others because of that nose. Their little, their little snout here in the eastern coral snake is always gonna be black and the other snakes will always be red or kind of pinkish white. Um, but that black is, is a big characteristic. Some of them um, actually, the Scarlet snake will have, um, scarlet king snake, excuse me, will have red, black, and yellow, just like this eastern coral snake. Uh, but one of the things to remember, there's a great rhyme that I learned when I was a kid. It's a uh, red on black, friend of Jack, red on yellow, like this guy, kill a fellow. Um, so just, that's a great way to remember those. Uh, red on yellow is a coral snake. Red on black is, uh, is usually a king snake. So these guys, um, are, they're really shiny. Uh, they're named, they're very brightly colored, which is where they get their name from, coral snake. Um, they usually will feed on snakes and lizards. They live mostly in sandy habitat, stay underground a lot of the time. So we very rarely see these guys. Um, they're tiny snakes. So the average length is two feet, the max is four. Uh, so that's another reason they're seldom seen, even though they're brightly colored. And then when they are threatened, they usually will either retreat or musk. Uh, they very rarely bite, but when they do, um, sometimes they hold on pretty tightly or they're known to hold on tightly and to even almost kind of chew um, when they bite. They don't have to chew to inject the venom, but uh, they, they, they are kind of known for doing that. These guys, remember, are the ones that have the neurotoxin there in the Coba family. Um, so a lot of times any kind of, uh, central nervous system uh, symptoms that you're gonna see. So respiratory failure, this, this or, or respiratory distress, asthma, that kind of thing is what you're gonna experience with these guys. Um, they are state listed endangered. So I have a big E right here in the picture. Um, so they are protected and they're pretty rare to find. Cottonmouths are the next one. A lot of people see these um, 
They are also called water moccasins, which I'm sure you probably have heard. They are our only venomous water snake that we have in North Carolina. They typically will have these dark bands over kind of an olive green or brown um, coloring on their backs. Uh, but sometimes I've seen them where they're almost completely black in color. Sometimes that's a product of the water or um, the tannins in the water, that kind of thing. But for the most part, they're just, they have a dark coloration to them. Um, the young ones will actually have kind of a reddish color. So sometimes they can sort of resemble copperheads and why people might confuse them with that. Uh, they are most active at night. Uh, they feed on a wide variety of prey. So rodents, frogs, fish, like we talked about other snakes even, uh, but they usually are found by water, not always, um, but usually because they are a water snake, they're semi-aquatic. And then uh, there's a lot of species that can look for cotton off. So banded water snakes, brown water snakes, northern water snakes, all of those that we have here in North Carolina. So this is probably, I would say, one of the more um, misidentified snakes that we have. Uh, but they do have a very characteristic behavior that you don't see in a lot of other snakes. They tend to keep their mouth open. Um, and lay that head back and their mouth is bright white on the inside, which is where they get the name cotton mouth from. And that's just a natural behavior they do when they get threatened. Um, they can also flatten their body, vibrate their tail, release musk. Um, their venom toxin, their venom is very toxic like we talked about, um, it's a hematoxin. Uh, but again, and their bites can be severe. Uh, I would say copperheads are the number one bites that we get in North Carolina. Cotton mouths are probably the second, um, if I had to guess. So the next three, uh, these are Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake. These are, are very large bodied. You can see they have dark uh, diamond, diamond shapes on their backs, surrounded by a white kind of an outline or a light colored outline. You can see here, I wouldn't say white, but um, light colored. And then they have usually a stripe over their eye. And then they have uh, these two light colored bands on either side of their eye. Um, these are the, um, they are the largest rattlesnake, rattlesnake species in the world. Uh, the average length is four feet, max length is eight feet. They are state listed, endangered. Um, they're mostly ambush predators. They eat mostly rodents and rabbits. They're found primarily in longleaf pine flatwoods and sand hills habitats. And they tend to overwinter in stumps and mammal burrows. So we don't see them super often. Again, their venom is highly toxic um, and can be destructive to tissues, uh, but they, and because they're so big, they can inject a lot of venom um, and, and death is known to occur from getting a, a diamond big, diamond back rattlesnake bite. But again, it's right here. Um, so timber rattlesnakes, these are also called cane breaks. Um, in the mountains, sometimes they can have um, kind of a yellowish color to them or dark gray in the Piedmont or coastal plain, you see the one that looks more here on the, on the picture, kind of a pinkish background with these chevron patterns going across the back and sometimes even this orange line that goes right down the middle. Um, they are state listed special concern species. So again, very rare, uh, very heavy bodied, uh, usually a dark tail. Again, they're ambush predators, just like the rattlesnakes and our other pit vipers. They eat mostly rodents and mice and squirrels and sometimes birds, they get too close. Uh, usually inhabit forested areas, but not always. They can use barns or rock outcrops. Um, probably half the rattlesnakes I've seen um, have been in uh, barns or around structures. The other half have been out in the woods. So they are very reluctant to bite. Uh, and they're even reluctant to rattle. I've never had one rattle at me. Uh, I've never had one strike at me. They're usually very cool and calm and collected, um, but the venom is very toxic. So if you do get bitten. Uh, the one rattlesnake that I did have rattle at me was an Eastern Diamondback. And again, that was the one that had almost been stepped on. Uh, the pygmy rattlesnake is actually uh, our smallest rattlesnake in North Carolina and also in the United States. Average length is one and a half feet, uh, max is about three. They're usually found in pine flatwoods, scrub oak forests. Uh, they also overwinter in logs and stumps, um, just like the other rattlesnakes. And uh, they're usually this dark gray or light gray pattern with these little dark gray uh, circles or patches all over their back and on their sides. There are other color morphs that exist. So some can be pink, um, some can be 
almost yellowish. Uh, these can also kind of get an orange stripe down the back like the timber rattlesnakes. Um, but these guys are pretty small. Uh, I've never seen one. I've seen plenty of hognose snakes that look just like this uh, or very similar, which is what you might mistake a pygmy rattlesnake for. Uh, but I've never actually seen one in the wild. Um, they eat lizards, mice, frogs, sometimes other snakes and large octopods, so insects, crayfish, and spiders, uh, probably wolf spiders. Um, and their bite is generally less serious because they're a smaller snake. You tend not to get as much venom, uh, but if you do, obviously seek medical attention. So the three rattlesnakes, again, are protected in North Carolina, as is the coral snake. But uh, just to remind everybody, all snakes in North Carolina are protected. Uh, you can't kill them without a permit unless they are an imminent threat. So if you have one that is striking at you or biting at you, you can kill it without a permit legally. Uh, but we really try to discourage that. Um, rattlesnakes are also the leading contributor to snake bites uh, in North America, not just North Carolina. Um, but they're rare, they rarely bite unless they're provoked. Uh, and if treated proper, properly, the bites are seldom fatal. So I'm going to move a little quicker now. I just wanted to cover the, the six venomous snakes we had in North Carolina. This is their distribution. And the reason I wanted to show you this is because another way that you can try to stay safe out in the woods is to know what you may or may not encounter. So again, if you can see my cursor here, if you think about, um, you know, Caswell, Caswell County, uh, it's right in here, uh, or maybe Vance County, um, which is uh, right here. Um, if you look at every single one of these maps, Caswell and Vance County do not have, uh, do not typically have snakes in them. So, or I mean, uh, five of our six venom snakes, because Copperhead's the only one that we have statewide. Uh, so that may, if you live in those two counties, for example, this will probably be the only species of venomous snake that you might encounter. Now, if you live in Columbus or Brunswick County down here, um, down by Wilmington, you very well could encounter any one of the six venomous snake species that we have in North Carolina. So just um, keep in mind, again, these, these range distribution maps are always changing, um, but that is one way to think about, you know, where you're going to be hiking, where you're going to be hanging out outside um, as to what you may even encounter. Uh, again, if, if you know you're in the mountains, you're not going to encounter a water snake. You're only going to encounter a copperhead or maybe a timber rattlesnake. So that can really help you uh, figuring out what, how you should respond. So here's our first poll question, Bob, if you can pull that up. Um, how many poisonous snakes naturally occur in North Carolina? So zero, two, three, five, or six. See how well you guys have been paying attention. And Kelly, just to note, you have about five minutes left. Oh, goodness. Okay. Ooh, six. Okay. So this is a, that trick question again. How many poisonous snakes occur in North Carolina? These are actually all venomous snakes, not poisonous. So the answer is actually zero. All right. So moving on. Um, goodness gracious, I have a lot to cover. Okay. So let me see if I can get back to this. There we go. So avoiding snakes, really watch where you're walking, pay attention. That's the biggest advice I can give you. Uh, don't rush. Um, wear long pants, closed toed shoes. I never hike in flip flops or shorts. Um, if I do hike in shorter pants, uh, it's always gonna be on designated trails. You can use hiking or ski poles, stay on the trails, um, and move, uh, avoid moving or picking up debris. So try not to toss logs, things like that. You're more likely to get bitten that way. Wear gloves when you're working outside. Uh, step on rocks and logs, not over them, if possible. And I say if possible because sometimes they're wet or sometimes you're just, un, um, it's insecure to step on that kind of thing. But if you step over them, there could very well be a snake on the other side of the log and you just stepped right in front of it versus if you stepped on top and then stepped way out, you're, you're gonna get that two to three foot clearance that you really need. And then learn more about snakes. So this is that eastern hognose snake that can look very similar to a pygmy, especially the pink colorations that are out there of the pygmy. If you do encounter a snake, stay calm, back away slowly, keep your distance, uh, wait for the snake to leave, take a detour, uh, and do not attempt to pick it up, move it, or kill it. And I caveat this because a lot of wildlife biologists like myself are known to try to pick up snakes, not venomous snakes, of course, but um, some other ones. 
So unless you know what you're doing, don't. Uh, if you get bitten, um, there's poison control number at the very top, call 911. That's really just um, in case you do have uh, additional problems from the bite, uh, if you develop a secondary infection, or if you do need antivenom, they will give it in very severe cases, uh, but it gives them additional time to procure it if they don't already have it at the uh, emergency room. Back away from the snake, again, stay calm, move slowly, get out of that strike zone, note the time of the bite, because sometimes that can help with swelling. Um, ID the species, I have a little asterisk here. Uh, if you can do that safely, um, sometimes we're in shock. We don't really remember the markings. So if you can take a photo, kind of zoom in from a distance uh, and try to get an ID on that species if you don't know what it is, that can help with treatment. Remove rings and watches, position the bite um, at or below heart level, try to return to the house, but do not try to drive yourself to the hospital unless you absolutely have to. People have been known to get dizzy um, in crash cars. And then mark the leading edge of swelling. Here's a whole list of things that you don't need to do. Um, freak out, don't try to cut the wound, don't try to suck out the venom. Um, a lot of these, like drinking caffeine or alcohol, can raise your heart rate, which just spreads the venom. Same thing for running. Um, bleeding, it just moves the venom around. It's not healthy. You could always cause secondary infection. Tourniquet can cause additional um, tissue damage, just like ice or water. Uh, pain relievers like aspirin or blood thinners, uh, which your blood pressure is already, already going to drop when you've gotten bitten. So just don't do that. Um, and again, don't try to handle the snake. So snake ID resources, there's a great up, there's a whole list of them in this Facebook public group. Uh, you can see over here, you can post a picture and uh, a professional or um, uh, somebody who's really good with snake ID will respond to what it is. So people, um, Posting your property boundaries, knowing your neighbors, uh, spending time on your property is really, that's one of the biggest deterrents to trespass. Wear blaze orange. I know several of you commented about a uh, concern about shooting accidents. If you have blaze orange, and I put 365 here because it needs to be visible from 365 degrees. So front, head, top, around, uh, not, just, not just a patch on the front of your shirt is important. Maintaining situational awareness, just what's around you, um, try to hike with someone and really pay attention to your intuition. There's only been a handful of times where I've kind of gotten a creepy feeling or the hairs have stood up on the back of my neck and I just turn, I just turn around. It's not worth it. Um, and then carry protection, whether that's your own hands, take a self-defense class or whether that's a knife or mace or firearm, whatever you feel comfortable with and are trained to use. And then get to know your local law enforcement officer. Accident and injury, it's kind of the same thing, maintain situational awareness. You could get trained in CPR or any of those classes that really uh, makes a difference in how comfortable you are in the woods. Check the weather, it always changes. Even if you check it, it can change, but it helps you prepare. Um, tell someone your route and when you'll get back and actually tell them when you get back. Um, and then you can use hiking poles to help with your stability. And don't wear earphones. That's one of the worst things you can do. Um, look up, look down, just really try to pay attention to sounds and sights and smells and that kind of thing. Again, uh, wear blaze orange or use reflective gear, bring extra food and water, wear those dirty boots, um, bring layers always, be prepared and have a plan. What happened? What do you do if something happens? Who are you gonna call? Do you have somebody walking with you? Are they gonna run back and get help? Have you told a ranger or a person where you're at? So there's a whole website. I'm gonna to try to skip over this. Um, if you are at all interested in bears, uh, there's a bearwise.org website that tells you exactly what you should do with an outdoor situation with bears um, and then at home basics, the things you can do to secure your house. Don't leave pet food outside, keep your dogs on a leash, remove bird feeders, that kind of thing when, when bears are active. Um, so there's a whole list of things to do. The website is phenomenal gives you tips on how, what you should do if you encounter a bear, um, you know, stand still, don't approach it, back away slowly. If it does see you, you can do the same thing, but don't run and chase, trigger a chase response. If it does approach you, you know, make sure, you know, you try to make yourself look bigger, make noise, get your bear spray out and go ahead and remove the safety latch um, and then back away only when it stops. And then if a bear charges you, uh, fight back, don't play dead kick at it, use anything you have, backpack, knife, whatever. 
The Wildlife Commission has a great uh, hotline and website for any other human wildlife interactions. I know you guys have already heard a talk on this, uh, but they've got tips for alligators and coyotes and elk and all sorts of things. So just some general considerations, keep your distance from wildlife, don't approach or feed, keep your pets on a leash, secure your garbage recycling. A lot of animals are attracted to food and smells. Again, maintain that situational awareness, feed your pets indoors, make noise. So your other poll question, has there ever been an unprovoked bear attack in North Carolina? Yes or no? And Bob, you could probably keep this one a little shorter than 30 seconds since I'm running out of time. Jen, how much time do I have left? Well, you're actually over a minute, so maybe you could uh, sum it up in a, let's say two, two to three minutes. Okay, I will try. Um, the no's have this correct. There has not ever been an unprovoked bear attack in North Carolina. And by unprovoked, I mean uh, not one where the bear is approached uh, intentionally or a dog has provoked it or things like that. Um, bears are usually very skittish. They tend to run the other way um, unless they've been fed, just like most animals. All right, so common ticks of North Carolina. Um, I'm gonna skip through a lot of the tick-borne diseases and stuff uh, because I ran out of time. But these are the ones you should worry about, especially the ones in the four on the left that are in this, in this green box are the ones that people tend to get attached to them the most. Lone star tick, American dog tick, brown dog tick, and uh, black leg or deer tick. So those are the ones you should be on the lookout for. There are several other species in North Carolina, but these are really the biggest ones. Um, and these are some of the diseases they can cause. Almost all of these are bacterial diseases. You know, you guys have heard a lot about Rocky Mountain spotted fever and Lyme disease, um, but there are a few others. Uh, the Bezia is actually a parasite, but most of these are bacterial diseases. They're usually not fatal, fatal if treated, um, but, and sometimes antibiotics will help, but really there's, there's not any cure vaccine. It's just, uh, just trying to avoid tick bites. So we're gonna go straight into that. Wear long sleeves and pants, um, use insect repellent, EPA registered, only use that on your skin. So it's a very low percentage of DEET um, or some other chemical, uh, or you can use non-DEET ones too that are a little more natural. Treat your clothes with permethrin, do not put this on your skin, uh, but the 0.5% is recommended for permethrin. Obviously shower as soon as possible, do a tick check, remove ticks promptly with tweezers, and then check clothing pets vehicles and gear. I've had little ticks sitting on my head, my uh, headrest in my truck with their little feet out just waiting for me to come back um, when I left the field one day. So just be aware. Don't do any of the wife's tail tricks. Don't try to remove it with nail polish or um, cover it in petroleum jelly. Uh, don't touch it with a hot match or flame. Don't freeze it off, yank it off, whatever. All of those uh, will pester the tick and may very well make it um, discharge saliva or vomit into your skin and that's usually how you get the bacteria or pathogens that they're carrying. Uh, if you can remove the tick very quickly, a lot of times uh, within a few hours of it actually attaching to you, you might very well not have um, had any of that saliva exchange and you might very well not have gotten any pathogens. So remove it quickly, do it properly, wash the area with soap and water or alcohol, save the tick, and record it because a lot of these, as you can see on that other picture here, a lot of them look very similar. So unless you get that adult female Lone Star that's got the characteristic spot on her back, it's gonna be hard to ID and your doctor will need to know what this. Here's a diagram of tick removal. Um, and then uh, just real quickly, what's in my backpack? Um, it's a very small backpack you can see in this picture, very lightweight, lots of pockets, water resistant, etc but here's a list of all of the things that I tend to carry in my backpack. Uh, it really only takes, um, it's, it's always less than maybe five or 10 pounds. It's really not much. Um, but all of this stuff, almost everything that I've had in my backpack, I've used at least once except for uh, my whistle and my mace. I have not had to use those. Um, I have not had to use my extra batteries for my headlamp, but I would have certainly been glad I had them I've not had to use a permanent marker. I keep that in there for snake bites. So if I do get swelling, I can mark the location. Um, and then matches or fire starters uh, down here on the bottom. I have not had to use those yet, but pretty much everything else I've used in here at some point in time. My first aid kit has this 
ton of stuff in it, but it's tea tiny. I've been able to cram a bunch of things in there, use those little individual packets of ibuprofen and aspirin, always carry Benadryl with me, things like that. So a little bit over, sorry, Jen. Um, that's my contact information if you guys have any questions or concerns. But uh, thanks for sticking around with me and um, listening to some of the information. I really hope it'll help you guys feel more comfortable out in the woods. Great, thank you, Kelly. That was awesome. Uh, definitely a lot of information for folks to uh, consider and, uh, and, and learn more about. So great for that. Thank you so much, Kelly. All right, well, we're gonna move forward with our next speaker. Our next speaker is Karen Clark, who is with the North Carolina Wildlife Commission. All right, Karen, the screen is yours. I forgot to say, Karen, while you're, you're getting that ready, uh, folks that did have some questions for Kelly, uh, since we're kind of running behind, we'll just save all those to the end. And uh, after Karen's presentation, if we have a, some time there, we can answer some questions, but we're also planning on staying after 2.30 for those folks that would like to stay around and we can get to some more of these questions at that time as well. Okay, Karen. All right, so can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, we can hear you and right. we see your presentation. Looks great. Perfect, all right. Well, my name is uh, Karen Clark and I'm the director at the Outer Banks Center for Wildlife Education. We're located in Kerala. Um, so really we're in the Northeast corner of the state. We sit on the Kurtuk Sound. It's just a short water over, uh, walk over to the ocean. So it's a really nice location. That's our glamor shot that I've put up there for you. Um, when I started here, I began developing programs to get citizens involved in efforts with our biologists and other biologists along on the coast. So most of my personal experience is with like the sea turtles. Then we started doing the Marine Mammal Stranding Network. I've done frog call surveys and a little bit of shorebird type of things. But over the years, we um, tried to expand different opportunities. And instead of just engaging people for long-term um, types of volunteering. We also try to use our visitors and um, do some um, engagement in citizen science and some other programs. So I've got a little bit of experience with um, a variety of kind of things. And today what we try to do is just um, take a little bit of some of the programs that we knew of that you could probably engage on um, statewide. So I do at the end of the presentation, I have a link. Somebody's got to remind me to post that in the chat, but I'll have um, a, a piece of paper with all the links um, if there's anything that piques your interest that you can um, uh, take a visit on later. So just so that we have kind of a, a good foundation, I just wanted to talk a little bit about citizen science because there's a lot of different uh, types of programs out there that will use that terminology. But the general idea is that in citizen science, you have to have a collaboration between scientists and volunteers. Um, and the idea is that they want to increase scientific knowledge, but simultaneously in the process, um, either provide access or exposure to scientific information um, to the community. So citizen science can be used to answer a defined research question, or it can be uh, used a lot of times to inform natural resource management decisions. But the bottom line is you have um, general non-professionals involved. You have professional scientists. You're trying to get data that's gonna provide meaningful application to real life issues. And then also you have a clearly defined education component. So to be a really citizen science, you really should have those types of components involved. Um, so some areas that citizen science is really kind of good at, um, at working on, one-time biological um, inventories of an area. You may have heard of bio blitzes before, so that's a really fun one to get involved with. Um, uh, kind of low commitment, lots of fun there. Um, also establishing baseline environmental data or supporting long-term monitoring programs. A lot of what I'm going to um, present today is probably in that realm um, with those types of programs looking to kind of monitor population status and trends. You're talking like distribution abundance, 
um, and also with the goal of um, identifying conservation and management needs for that area. So a lot of the programs, I think, fall into those two categories that I'll talk about today. But sometimes researchers will also use um, uh, citizen science um, to uh, uh, kind of as a, as a, as a pre-survey of the area or, um, or, or the start of a, a more in-depth, um, rigorous scientific effort. Um, so there's really different ways to be able to uh, match that out. But in general, citizen science can be a really useful tool for, um, uh, for researchers uh, because you can really fill in different gaps, geographically, quantitatively, um, temporally. The bottom line is that with citizens involved, you're really um, increasing your manpower with this. So you can reach um, you know, more places, you can reach geographically isolated places, and you get a lot of more um, survey effort out of this. So when designed carefully, citizen science can really be a useful tool for researchers and managers, but at the same time, and this is, I think, the beauty of it, it simultaneously engages the very community um, that are sharing in those natural resources. So you really get, of all the participants, you tend to foster a really good sense of place and caring in everybody. And it, it really tends to be a win-win between both the researchers and um, the participants. Okay. So with that said, I'm just going to um, talk a little bit about some of the programs that we've identified that um, might be um, worth getting involved with. Um, but they all use kind of a same, uh, most of them use the same general premise. So you need to have a data sheet, right? And, and there are still some programs out there that have paper data sheets. So if the technology scares you, don't worry, there is still a program out there for you. In fact, I think that's one thing to be said is that you know, with citizen science and, and the boom that's out there, um, you can probably find something that would be an interest, um, you know, for you. Um, most of the ones that I'm talking about today, they do tend to use um, projects either using smartphone apps or a website portal that you would enter your data. Some of them will have paper data sheets and you can use your choice of if you do it, um, if you do it in the field or you take the data sheet back to the desk and enter it in at the computer there. So there are some, there is some flexibility, but a lot of times basically what they're asking you to do is just submit a photo or a sound or just some sort of um, environmental data fields that they're asking for and their apps tend to walk you through that process. Uh, for the types of programs where we're trying to do species monitoring, a lot of times there's going to be identification involved with that. That could be intimidating, but I want you to bear in mind that really these programs are designed to have you um, trying to, to, to think about um, the different, um, all different levels of experience involved, okay? So if, even if you're a beginner, you should not be intimidated. They have trainings um, and then they have tools in place and they also have community in place to be able to help you through that. So even though they may ask for species ID, sometimes you can do kind of a broad general group or even if you've got that photo involved with it, they'll get a, um, a researcher or, uh, or a biologist to help to identify those or even some of the community members who are, are a part of that. So please don't be intimidated by those aspects. Um, also, of course, don't forget that there are ID tools out there. So certainly the, um, the field guides, um, you know, your standards, um, you know, Peterson, Stokes, um, Sibley's, those are all really good brand names in, um, in guides out there. And there are also some um, apps that are really starting to come online too to help you out. So the one that I, um, if you haven't had a chance to explore this yet, um, iNaturalist, which is a citizen science program in and of itself, um, but it has a subset kind of component of it called Seek. So th they are two different apps. You could download those, but they both, um, they're by the same creators and they use this artificial intelligence. I actually kind of like to start off with the Seek because as soon as you boot it up, it just, it turns on your camera and you point it at what you're trying to look at and it tries to figure it out. And it's really fun because it'll, it'll go kind of taxonomically. So it'll just start off really kind of broad. It'll be like, hey, it's an animal. And then, oh, it's a vertebrate. And then it might go to, you know, oh, it's a, um, you know, it's a lizard. Oh, it's a skink. And it might just stop there at skink. It might not give you the full species identification, but it at least really kind of takes you down. If you take a photo of that, you know, it could say, hey, do you want to submit this to iNaturalist? The really cool thing about iNaturalist is that if you submit that, and even if you just put it down at what the, um, um, the computer kind of identified it as, as a skink, you'll get some, um, you know, some really good uh, big uh, uh, skink geeks out there who might take a look at your photos and they just love identifying things for you. So they'll help to, um, um, to get that. And once you actually get three identifying um, 
identifiers in agreement with each other, it becomes um, a record that can be used for research. So they call it a research grade um, you know, record. And then once it's in iNaturalist, then um, various researchers could actually query to get some of the, um, depending on what kind of terms they're looking for, some of those um, submissions they can actually use in their research. So really by putting into iNaturalist, you could be part of a lot of different types of um, of research efforts. And it's really kind of fun to see you can go through your records and it'll show you which ones were picked up for those. You can also, iNaturalist will have um, projects that you can join. Um, and so you can submit, um, you'd be able to submit some entries through those projects too. So it's really a, um, a really good tool, not only just for using identification, but it's probably a really great start into becoming a, a stronger naturalist um, because again, the community just kind of helps you to, um, you know, to be able to, gain your um, identifying skills. Um, other tools, so birds, um, Merlin is a guide. It's an app that you can um, download. It is fee-based. It tends to go on sale around Christmas time, just as an FYI, um, but also eBird. eBird is very similar to iNaturalist. It's a way to kind of keep track of your bird um, entries and you can also join, um, join different projects with that. But it has an identification feature in that, which would help you with the birding. And there's one for dragonflies. Also, some of the different projects, they may have actually identifying tools built within them, like um, Project Bumblebee has um, the ability to help you try to identify some of, the, um, some of the bumblebees that you're looking at there. OK, so what I thought I would do is just kind of go through different kind of categories here. Um, so if birds are your thing, trust me, you're in the great spot because Honestly, a lot of the citizen science really um, um, was birthed and just has, has grown from the birding community. So there are a lot of programs out there if you are a birder or a want to be birder. Um, and that's the brilliant thing about it as well is that it can kind of grow your, um, your skill with that. So we've already talked about eBird. Um, Nest Watch and Osprey Watch, those are two different types of programs that you know are looking at kind of um, the reproductive process of, of these guys. So you're monitoring nesting activity, right? So um, they want you to identify sometimes when the pair arrives, like egg laying behavior, you might see um, you know hatching and then fledging and that type. So with Nest Watch, it's just kind of any nest that you have, um, you know, that might be around on your property, or it may be that you have a um, a bird box. And um, the frequency of that is that basically you're checking maybe every three to four days on that um, when there's activity on that. With Osprey, it's similar, except you're going to do about once a week um, with that. Um, although you can do it as little as once a month, um, honestly, to, to contribute to that one. And so that's basically as long as the Osprey are around and um, exhibiting that nesting activity. Uh, Project Feeder Watch is one for the winter time, um, and you can put up a bird feeder and observe that. So you can really do it from anywhere. Honestly, you could do it from your kitchen window. Um, you could do it out, um, you know, in the property. You don't even have to have a bird feeder for that one. Anywhere that birds tend to come and forage during that time, it's trying to document winter activity on kind of a weekly basis. But again, it's just very flexible, and you could maybe, you know, even just enter once or twice in the winter, or you could went, enter um, information weekly throughout the winter months. So. So it is really try to build in some flexibility um, for the user there. There's another program called um, North Carolina Bird Atlas, which is literally just launching now. Um, it's a five-year effort, and um, we're really excited about that. And um, timeliness here next week, if you um, want to join us, there's going to be a um, uh, uh, the first workshop about that. I did talk to some of the... Um, um, some of the organizers of the, the Bird Atlas and mentioned that I was speaking here today if they had anything to share. And certainly for landowners, um, you know, they're going to be, um, you know, if you want to survey your land and contribute it to the Bird Atlas, they're going to have a, a, um, a project in eBird that you can link to. Um, if you're not feeling comfortable in surveying your land and you'd rather have um, a biologist come and do it, uh, that's an option as well that they had mentioned. So I just really encourage you to take a look at this project. We're really kind of excited about that coming up. These, um, the programs down at the bottom of the screen, Great Backyard Bird Count, Christmas Bird Count, Global Big Day, all of these are kind of annual one day, maybe two day um, events where you go out and typically as a group, and there's always going to be um, assigned experienced birders in that group. So it's a really good way to be able to kind of go out and comfort again, no matter what your level is and kind of gain some confidence there. 
Um, in general, uh, great backyard bird count is typically in February. Christmas bird count is mid-December to January, hence its name. That one you go out for one day and you survey and you count all the birds um, on your, your track in, the, in that area. So it's just one, you know, one day a year, um, although there are different routes. So you might be able to, if you really um, enjoy that, you can get out on a couple of them. Um, global big day is again, just another little kind of snapshot, get the count all day, um, try to get as many people across the world to do it um, at that time. And that's sort of a springtime um, event when they do that one. Uh, the night jar survey is just again, once a year at night, you go out during the full moon and you can listen or look for these guys. I really, so I have a lot of bird intimidation. I find them very intimidating because there's just so many of them and a lot to learn, but I'm like night jars. I think I could do that. You know, I could you know, listen to that and um, go out during the evening. So that's one I might even be taking a, um, a look at here um, shortly, but um, so moving basically from feathers to, well, I was gonna say scales, but I guess scales and skin, <laughs> um, uh, uh, so herps, right? So reptiles and amphibians. Um, uh, CASP, which is the Calling Amphibian Survey Program, that's run out of the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. But there's also Frog Watch USA. What you do with those is you go out at night and you're listening for frog calls. So, um, and there's lots of great ways to kind of practice, um, you know, those calls. And we do a lot of workshops with that to try to build your confidence in that. Um, and you just go out and you listen and you record kind of abundance. And it's really just by like, hey, I hear a few. Oh, wow, that's a, a, a nice number to, oh my goodness, they're, it's a deafening chorus of spring peepers, right? Um, so it's going out and kind of recording what you're seeing with that. Um, Frog Watch USA is really a great way to kind of jump into that because you can do that from anywhere um, at any time. Its survey window is basically February through August. Um, with CASP routes, um, those are driven routes where you drive about 10 miles and stop every mile listening to, to frogs. Um, and that one has like three different windows that we do during the winter months. So it runs basically from January to June and you just try to get out about one time in each of those three windows. Um, box turtle connection, if you've got box turtles running around on, the, on, on, on your property, um, you could get trained to monitor those turtles and then actually mark them. So there's a way to make a, a notch kind of on the, um, on the margins of the turtle, and then you can identify that turtle and, and you'll start to see, you know, the same ones again, and you'll be able to identify them and make records. So this is a mark recapture type of um, study. You'll start to really get to know them by name, you know, and the like. So that's a really fun one to, um, to get involved with. And then Herp Mapper and Carolina um, um, Atlas, those are other ones where you're basically there, um, uh, sites or apps that you just uh, uh, submit sightings whenever you see them. Um, but I can tell you that our biologists um, get the data from, um, from those and find that valuable as well. So it's a really a great way to make sure that you're contributing to some of our, um, um, our knowledge base there. And of course, you can't forget the creepy crawlies, right? So um, arthropods, so all those insects out there from ladybugs, caterpillars, dragonflies, bumblebees, butterflies, there's a program out there for you. Um, so a lot of them like, um, so let's see, uh, lost ladybug. And, well, most of them tend to be um, um, just see it, record it, log it uh, type of um, uh, program. So the bumblebee and the ladybug one. Um, now, caterpillar accounts, that one actually is sort of a survey effort that you would go out maybe on a weekly, um, you know, basis. And again, because it's insect oriented, you're talking spring, summer is when they focus that. Um, you can see my colleague, Marissa, she's shaking um, a tree there and um, there's a white sheet underneath it that catches basically um, all the insects that fall off of that. Um, and again, they, um, you know, uh, you can broadly group them and classify them for this project. So um, there's a, ver a variety of ways to get involved with that. Um, dragonflies, of course, are just really, uh, you know, if, if there could be a charismatic insect, I think they are like, they're just, they're very captivating, I guess is, is really what it is. Um, but uh, dragonfly pond watch, and then also migratory dragonfly, what they're trying to do is to, um, there's certain migratory species, so there's some monitoring for that. Um, pond watch is um, uh, uh, similar, um, but it does have sort of a set time of when um, you tend to collect the data with, with those. Um, and then there's also, there's another um, Odonata central that you can just always put in your, your various sightings of those dragonflies. Um, bumblebee watch, I talked a little bit about that. That one has the identifier in that. It's just basically see the bumblebee, record it. And remember all of these, um, most of the interests of people are 
trying to understand um, even some of the environmental changes and impacts that we have so we can track the population changes over time, what's going on with climate change with these animals, what's going on with um, some of the environmental stressors that may you know, happen or habitat defragmentation, those types of things. So bear in mind that it's not only kind of exciting to just kind of see these records, but it really is going to a greater um, you know, understanding and trying to make some, some difference there. Um, Monarch Watch, by the way, has a couple different projects involved with it, but check it out. So from tagging butterflies to just um, recording when you're seeing them, to even doing milkweed surveys and looking for like um, uh, eggs and, and larvae on there. Um, and then you can also get wet with this thing, you know, and just other kind of environmental types of programs. So King Tide, and then there's this LOX, which is a lake observation program. Um, they both, you know, basically have gauges that you're taking a look at. King Tide is very interested in those extreme events that, that we get and documenting those. Um, and so this is actually the, uh, the gauge that we have right here out on, on our sound. Um, the locks or the lake observation one, those are trying to do some of the um, coastal um, lakes, the Carolina bays, you know, that we have. So you can see kind of the blue dots on there if you're located anywhere near there. there. Really what they're doing is just trying to take a look at people to get um, gauge readings off of it. Um, it is associated, there's two different ways they're doing it. So the visual, what is the water height? Um, and then they're also trying to get aerial shots of, this, of the surface area, just to understand how the, um, the water is um, is changing in that area. And so there are some time frames that they tend to like you to go out and do the, um, the readings, but it's also not tied to it. Um, so um, if that's if you're in the vicinity of any of these types of um, lakes that might be worth looking into. Um, and then there's, of course, just, you know, in, in, in general, aquatic monitoring. Um, so North Carolina Stream Watch, it's a little bit more oriented towards being sort of an education base, but it's a great way to get started and get comfortable um, where you just kind of choose your sites. Uh, you also commit to some, um, you know, cleanups, you know, in the year, and then you do different types of water quality assessments. And they can be very minimal to getting a little bit more in depth of even measuring, you um, the um, some different parameters within the um, within the pond or the the water source that you're at. Uh, there is an aquatic hub that's starting to form. I think it's been held back a little bit by COVID last year, but hopefully it'll start moving forward again. Um, and so if you start really getting into the water monitoring, that's a place that's really trying to um, uh, uh, get all the different kind of monitoring efforts, um, you know, working together so that there's a, a unified place for that to come in. So keep an eye on that one. I'm really um, optimistic about what that could bring to us. Um, and then plants, right? You know, I saw at the beginning how everybody's really looking forward to spring here and getting out and seeing the, um, the emergence of, of, of the different um, wildlife and wild plants that we have coming out. So Project Bud Burst is exactly that. Um, I mean, there's, again, that one has a couple different projects that you go in there, but basically it's just recording different observations that you're seeing of the um, transition of plants from, you know, um, leaves emerging to um, the flowers, to fruit, uh, pollinators is another part of that. So that's a really kind of um, neat project to be a part of. And then even just, so Coco Raw is a, um, is a rain gauge uh, type of um, program. So um, that one, um, you have this, uh, this rain gauge here and you just record every day what you see in it. So of course, most interest is going to be when you get the, um, the rain events and you record on that. But it's, it's an app on the phone. So really as a daily basis, you walk by, it's zero. It's one button that you push to just say zero and it's you know, submitted that way. But zero, you hang out with any scientists or, or researchers. Zero is a very important number to us. Um, a lot of times that's what we're trying to capture is kind of like when we go from zero to, to seeing something else. So don't forget those, um, those zeros in there. Um, you can go on vacation, don't get me wrong, just because it's a daily submission, they understand that it won't be um, necessarily continually monitored, but as much as you, you know, can. And really the goal with that is, you know, I mean, the joke everybody always talks about, you know, like if you don't like the weather here, go two blocks away, right? Um, so it's just trying to increase the resolution of where, um, you know, of kind of the rain input that comes into the areas. And, um, and it's tapped into by a lot of different researchers. So it's a great way to contribute to a lot of different programs. Um, and then outside of these uh, sort of citizen science projects that are engaged, certainly, you know, helping out our wildlife agency, um, we put out, our biologists will put out requests every once in a while for just different observations or different types of samples to be sent to them. So right now, just to name a few, you know, just alligator sightings, um, 
uh, and we actually have a project in iNaturalist that you can join. So it's easy as getting the picture and submitting it into iNaturalist. If you're not comfortable using iNaturalist, they do allow you to put email um, submissions into that as well. So all of this, um, there's a link to the details of that in my um, handout that I have for you. But that, um, that helpline too that Kelly was mentioning, there's an email address associated with that. So you can route anything through there and it'll get to the biologists appropriately as well. Um, our bat biologists, so we've been doing some um, acoustic monitoring with, um, you know, with bats in the area, but the biologists are also just interested um, in finding different kinds of roosts. And so if you are a property owner and you have a cave or um, some sort of area that you see a lot of um, bats hanging out and you don't mind biologists coming on to um, to be able to monitor that, they'd be really interested in, um, in, in that and really expanding that statewide. So there's been a lot of effort in the mountains, but we'd really like to get a better understanding throughout the state of the um, population dynamics of, um, of the bats, especially with white nose syndrome um, having hit the areas. Barn owls is, a, um, you know, is, a, is another one that is definitely something that their biologists are interested in. Um, and if you have, if you actually have barn owls on your property and you'd like to have a nest box, then the Wildlife Resources Commission will come out and um, install best uh, nest box for you. So that's another opportunity there. Feral swine, uh, if you see signs of them destroying the habitat, um, you know, they just wreak havoc on livestock, on the on crops, things like that. So um, for the capture program, if you see any of things like that, um, there's a place to enter that onto our website as well so that they can um, guide their capture programs that way. Um, the cute little hellbender down there, right? Look at that name. Um, so uh, sightings of, um, of those guys are, uh, are of some interest. Pine snakes is another, especially pine snake sightings in the, um, in the Southern Mountain region. Um, also, there's a disease that's been hitting rabbits, um, uh, rabbit hemorrhagic disease. Fortunately, it's not hit North Carolina yet, but we're trying to be preemptive and keep an eye on that. So if you notice dead rabbits on your land and really no explanation for why they're dead, and if you see blood in their nose or, um, or mouth area um, or the rectum, then definitely we want the biologists to become aware of that. So try to keep records of that. And they may even be interested in, in collecting the carcass and, and sampling from there. Also, if you're out and about regularly, especially you know if you do hunting, then there's different surveys to get involved with. So for um, uh, grouse um, hunters, there's a survey to try to um, um, get a, a better idea of what our population is looking like with those. It's another species that has hit um, West Nile viruses is a concern with that one. So um, there's surveys to get involved with that. Turkey broods, you don't even have to be a hunter to be involved with that one because that is just taking surveys on normal patrols in your land. So if you see turkeys around and like to participate in that, definitely check that one out. And then um, the fur bearer and the um, and the, the game program. So that's done a lot with the, um, uh, a lot of the monitoring typically is surveyed with kind of the deer hunters, but it's just looking for kind of your typical, you know, um, uh, fur bearers. So, you know, raccoons, squirrels, counts, things, things all like that. So it's kind of a fun way to, to immerse yourself within the, the wildlife that's around you as well and to understand um, kind of the, the population trends of those as well. And then finally, if you have, uh, if you do any hunting or trapping or you have people, you know, hunting or trapping on your lands, we have these cooperative programs. Um, so there's a, um, a lot of times biologists love the teeth because it helps us to, um, to age animals. So deer jaw bones, bear teeth, um, the, the deer ones now, they're using photos as well. So um, there's information about the kind of photos to be able to get with that. For trappers, anything from um, jaw bones from otters, bobcats, spotted skunks and weasels, that's another one that they're looking for. And then of course, um, you know, with disease monitoring. So I mentioned with the grouse that there's concern about um, West Nile virus with those. So um, uh, from hunters, they ask for uh, blood samples um, and uh, feather to be able to test for that. And then um, chronic wasting disease as well in, um, in deer, that's something else that if you see anything um, unusual in the deer population on your land. So um, it's, a, it's a neurological disease, right? So it, it causes a lot of times maybe some repetitive, weird like pacing um, or drooling or just a really kind of dazed face amongst the, um, the animals. Um, that's something that, that we're looking to be reported as well. So if I haven't mentioned anything that tickles your 
um, <laughs> your citizen science bone, check out SciStarter. You can put in different criteria, topics that you're looking for, and it has a lot of different projects on there. A little bit overwhelmingly um, as well um, on there. So, um, but it, it is a good place to, um, you know, to, uh, to take a look if you're looking for some more opportunities. Um, and then just kind of to, to, to bring it home and to say, well, you know, again, why do we want to do this? Um, so the, the value is, is really, remember, what we're trying to do is produce meaningful data for our researcher, but also have that defined education, um, you know, goal with that in citizen science. So by engaging with it, you're really, you know, becoming part of the program. It fosters a sense of place and caring amongst the participants. And really what happens is that the results tend to inform your public, right? So, the, so, so you get involved more and you understand the management that's happening. And not only do you understand the management, but the managers understand how you're using the area and what's valued to you. And so it really becomes this collaboration. And so it just wins between both, um, you know, kind of teams there. So especially when there's projects that involve both kind of um, uh, natural and social dimensions, um, again, it just, it's, it's a win-win for, um, from all the participants. This is just a screenshot from one of our um, acoustic monitors and they just basically said, when you're asked to go out and record bats for the wildlife, say yes. Um, so they had a really good time on that one. Okay. Um, so that's it. Um, and um, again, what I'm gonna do is uh, stop sharing my screen and then I'm going to paste in the link for, um, uh, for my handout for you. Hopefully. Any questions while I get my act together? Yeah, if you if, uh, looks like we ha do have one question. If you're good, we'll try to find that at the same time. Yes, um, I'll multitask. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, so, I know what uh, happened. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Cheryl is saying that she is planning to start a kids summer camp on her farm. Does North Carolina Wildlife Resources have the capability of sending someone out once a week for an hour to talk about some wildlife topics with kids? So we do have an education um, division. Um, right now, outreach is a little bit challenging um, um, for that, but we certainly do have a, a variety of resources on that. So if you go to our um, uh, ncwildlife.org and the learning components, you could see there are regional education specialists. Um, so we have them in the mountain, um, in the Piedmont, and in the, um, in the coastal region. So they may be able to at least give you some resources. I can't promise that they could come and visit, but they have uh, resources that they could probably um, provide for you. Um, also, um, we have been involved a lot in a partnership with the North Carolina Arboretum. They have a program called Eco Explore. Um, and so if you're doing some camp kids, I really, I would encourage you to take a look at that. I think that'd be a lot of fun to get folks involved with that. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have one more. So Judith was wondering, do the inputs from a lot of the different programs, do they come from natural areas or can it just be what they see in their backyard? Oh yeah, so that's a really cool thing. So even um, we're gearing up for uh, um, a program that's called, oh gracious, it is on my handout, which I put the link in um, the, um, the, the chat just now. Um, but there's a, um, a, a city nature challenge, okay? So it doesn't necessarily always have to be in just natural spaces. Most times what they do want though are, are natural sightings, but um, the idea of like city nature challenge is just saying that, you know, nature is everywhere. Um, you know, with that. And so it's, um, it's, it's basically a bio blitz that happens, I think, over like four days, and it's a competition um, to put as many entries into iNaturalist as, as you can, and the cities will compete against each other for the number of um, entries that they can get. So that might be something to look into. Very cool. Okay, uh, one more. Um, from your experience, which would you say would be the most kid or student friendly in terms of ease of use? Oh, golly, there, there are a lot of programs um, out there that are really designed for kids, but I, I, um, I really do enjoy this Eco Explore program. If you have not experienced that one um, yet, um, it's uh, like this. Um, uh, 
it is a um, incentivized based type of thing. So kids earn points for making submissions and those submissions um, do get put into iNaturalist. So that's where they end up getting used, but they protect the, the um, children's um, identities and things by filtering it at, through their Eco Explore program. And they have prizes for kids and badges that they could, um, that they could work for towards. Awesome, great. That is awesome, Karen. Thank you so much. Uh, you have definitely provided a lot of information, uh, great opportunities for folks to become involved and share some of the observations that they see on their property. You know, we always get those questions of where folks want to be able to, to share what they're seeing and uh, great opportunities to do that and to probably learn a lot more as well, um, as well as bringing children and getting children involved and and creating and their learning and yearning for nature and to be outside. All right, well, thank you so much again, Karen. We appreciate you taking the time to be here. And uh, if you're gonna stay on, uh, once again, both speakers will be on after the, the regular meeting, we'll stop at 2.30, but both Karen and Kelly have agreed to stay on for another 20 to 30 minutes. So if you have more questions, there will be plenty of time after this to, uh, to ask a few more questions. So. Uh, keep that in mind as we keep moving forward. All right, so we will uh, just kind of close up here with a, a few things that we have. I can share my screen, okay. Let's see, I thought I was sharing my screen. I'm not sharing my screen, there we go. Apologize for that. All right, so uh, of course, every each meeting in Forrester, we love to give away things. Uh, just trying to have another way to interact and communicate with folks. So uh, Susan Owen and Lynn Caldwell are two lucky winners of our Forrester Travel Mug. So we will be in touch with you by email to see the best way to get your mug to you. So congratulations for that. And uh, we thank you for, for joining us today for this. And um, for those of you that are looking for more information and have enjoyed the Forrester webinar series so far, oh, next month we will start a new series called Protecting Your Woods. So April 8th, we will uh, start talking about hunting leases, hunting leases, excuse me, land posting and trespassing. So uh, put those on your calendar. We hope that you can make a, a few minutes or a, an hour and a half or so to join us for that as well. So be on the lookout for that. If, uh, if you joined us today, then obviously you received our email or you heard about the virtual meetings. So if you're a social media person, feel free to check out our Facebook group and join us uh, and ask some questions or share some pictures of, of what's going on in, on your property or kind of what you're, what you're doing or what you're enjoying, enjoying seeing out there in the woods as you walk through the woods and, and start to enjoy or learn more about nature or something that maybe you're looking to learn more about. Uh, follow us on Instagram and of course feel free to send us an email at forestherNC at gmail.com. If you have questions or if there's something that you would, per, would like to uh, for us to do something different or share or if you just have a question for us we, we would love to hear from you. Uh, so please uh, feel free to, to shoot us an email and and uh, we'll get back with you. Uh, we still have a website that will be out soon. That will be a, a, a very uh, good opportunity for folks to check out some of our previous webinars and, and check for updates. And, and uh, hopefully we'll even start a series on some of our women landowners here across North Carolina and just kind of share their stories and talk about the, the interesting and cool things and, and maybe some challenges and things that they've met along the way in managing their property. So we'll look forward to that real soon. We do uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we do want to remind folks uh, that this is a recorded webinar. The previous webinars that we have have done have been recorded as well. The, I, I don't, we don't have the link. I don't know if Kelly was able to post that in our chat box or not. But the easiest thing to do is to go on YouTube, www.youtube.com, YouTube and then in the search box on YouTube, just put in Forest Her NC. Now make sure you add the initials NC so that will take you 
to several videos that we have posted and you will get access to all of the previous Force Her webinar recordings. So you can go back and you can watch those as many times as you need to uh, and, uh, and get the information that you're looking for there. Once again, we thank you very much for joining us. We do have an evaluation form. So when you leave this meeting, you will be taken to a, a survey that we, we please, 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 if you could just give us a, just a few minutes and jot down some, some things and comments about what you liked, what you'd like to see different, what you'd like to learn more about. Uh, that is what we use to help uh, create new workshops and new programs for the future. And, and if, we, if we don't know what you're interested in or know what you're looking for, it's hard for us to do that. And we're just going to keep feeding you the stuff that we want you to know. And uh, we want to know to make sure that we are, are reaching folks that, that have some questions and, and want to know more about certain, certain topics. So please. Uh, thank you once again for joining us. Uh, it is 2.30, and so that does end our, our Forest Her meeting for today. Thank you very much. And once again, if you'd like to stay on for a few minutes, we'll just take a, take a one-minute break, and then we will uh, start asking a few questions of our speakers. Thank you again. Okay, let's see, Karen, and uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Karen and Kelly, hi, once again. So it looks like we still have about 46 folks still on the line or on our computer screen here. And uh, so we will uh, ask a few questions. We had several for Kelly that we still had left over. If I can get to the right box here. All right, so Kelly, we'll just start with you. All right, uh, let's see. Roxanne would like to know, there are these snakes are both the venomous snakes that you had gone over where you had your slide and had the six different snakes. Oh, there are both beautiful and important. So what is the cause of two endangered species and the habitat loss? Um, so there's actually, uh, let's see, you guys can hear me okay, right? Yes, yep. sounds great. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick if I can. Let me figure out how to do this again. Um, let me go back. Let's see. Escape. And while you're doing that, I'll answer another question while you're finding that. Uh, Sylvia, if you're still on the line, uh, the link, we, I don't think we have the link to our YouTube website uh, on us right this second, but if you want to go to youtube.com, you can search it. Just make sure you put in Forest Her in C, and it should take you to those recordings. The recording for today will give us about a week, five to seven days to get the, re, the, the recording for today uh, put up on YouTube. So just give us a little bit of time for today's. Actually, Jennifer, the link to the previous webinars is available in chat. I just reposted it. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Bob. So Bob has taken care of that, if y'all can see that. All right, uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes. With the snakes, okay. So there's actually um, two that are state listed endangered. So the Eastern Coral Snake and the Eastern Diamond Back Rattlesnake. And then there's two that are also listed, but they're listed as species of special concern. So they have a slightly wider habitat distribution or range distribution, I should say. Uh, and those are the timber rattlesnake and the pygmy rattlesnake. So we actually have four that are listed in North Carolina, um, not just two. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, but just so you guys can see that. Um, mostly it is habitat destruction and habitat loss are, are the primary factors that are causing our uh, rattlesnake decline and coral snake decline, um, but it's also human persecution, so killing um, needlessly or intentionally, uh, but, and it's also illegal collection. So there actually is a venomous snake trade and people will illegally collect venomous snakes to sell or to use for religious purposes or um, just, just whatever. Um, so those are kind of your three primary, most, mostly habitat loss. Um, 
and destruction, but the other two are, are pretty significant impactors as well. Okay. All right, we do have another one for you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna switch, switch gears a little bit from snakes to coyotes. All right, so Jada was saying they've had the coyote attacks in Greensboro on some trails and they've seen some on their own property where they've come across packs of dogs. So what should someone do if they encounter a pack of dogs or maybe they see a coyote and not sure if it's a coyote or a wild dog? Um, so coyotes usually um, are also pretty skittish even though they can be curious. Um, I've been out walking or jogging and seen one um, kind of out into the woods and they usually will just kind of stand there and look at you and for a few seconds and then run away. Um, presuming you even see them in the first place, usually they'll scurry away before you even get there. Um, but if like any animal, whether it's a alligator or um, elk or deer or uh, raccoon or anything uh, that has been fed or a black bear, that kind of thing, um, if they have been fed previously by people, then they start associating people with food. And so they will approach people, um, which is a lot of times the kind of instigating factor for coyotes attacking is because they're trying to get food um, or they think you have food. The only times I've ever had a bear approach me or an alligator approach me or a coyote approach me, it's because they had been fed previously. Um, almost always 99% of the time when I see something like that, even if it's considered a predator species, they tend to run away. Um, so in the case of having a, a coyote, you know, again, it's some, of, it's some of those things, same things you can do with black bears, um, stand your ground, make noise, uh, make yourself try to look big. Uh, in the case of a coyote, you can um, haze it or throw things at it, you can throw rocks at it or tennis balls or squirt it with a water hose if you're in your front yard, um, something like that. Uh, pepper spray, I noticed, was an option. Um, pepper spray usually doesn't, I mean, unless it's right up on you, it's not going to be, um, you're going to have a hard time getting pepper spray into a coyote unless it's actually physically attacking you. Um, but pepper spray or bear spray, those things can work if they actually do approach you and get close enough for you to spray it. But you got to watch if it's really windy outside or something, you can hurt yourself in the process. So just be careful of that. Um, wild dogs or feral dogs are another kind of a whole nother ball game to me. Um, that's why I said earlier, it's interesting to see what everybody listed on their uh, registration form is the things that they're concerned with. Because my primary concerns when I'm out in the woods are people by far, that's my number one concern. And then feral hogs or feral swine and then feral dogs. Those are my top three things. I could care less about snakes or bears or alligators or elk or any of those because I, I know enough to be able to discourage or even eliminate those encounters if I don't want to. Um, but those are the kind of three things that I worry the most about. And, and there are ways, um, you know, with dogs carrying sticks with you, uh, making noise. Almost always uh, when you hear about a report in the news about wildlife attacking a person and they nobody was actually there to witness it or, a, you know, they find a bear that's feeding on a person's carcass remains. It's almost always a scavenging thing. And that person has actually been killed by dogs, a pack of dogs. They'll do forensic analysis afterwards on the saliva, on the bite wounds and things. That's, been, that's happened several times in the last few years in North Carolina. So um, feral dogs are something to watch out for. I, I would say you could get some tips from your animal control about what to do, but some of the same things, try to, you know, make noise, get big, uh, act scary. <laughs> okay, well, on the same topic of coyotes, and I, and I think a lot of folks have seen this in the news, and I think coyotes are always one of those things that, that give folks a scare, particularly when they start seeing them in their neighborhood, or um, if you're a social media person and you do some of those next door apps and, and things like that, people are always posting about small dogs or cats or things, but you know, what should the, the average person be concerned about when it comes to coyotes, maybe in their neighborhood or? Um, so I would say uh, if you are gonna be concerned about coyotes, probably the biggest thing would be just um, a chance encounter of a coyote, female coyote that has pups or getting close to a den that she may have in the area. 
um, they can be aggressive and will defend that territory and those and those pups. So that would be something that is just going to be a by chance scenario unless you know where the den is and you're provoking the animal. Um, that's just going to be a happenstance scenario. Usually it's either because the coyotes are fed or your dog is off leash and has started barking at or attacking the coyote and then they defend. Um, at same thing, cats, they can predate cats, um, which is another great reason to keep your cats inside. But uh, it's really those are the big things. I mean, coyotes, obviously they can get rabies just like any mammal can, uh, but they are not the uh, top vector or even the top species uh, for submissions to get rabies. That's by far raccoons. And then skunks, bats, and foxes are behind them. So there's only a handful of coyotes every year that, that uh, will get rabies that we know about and may interact with somebody and they actually get tested at Department of Health and Human Services. So um, really it's just those ones that have really gotten habituated to people or feel threatened. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, oh, how and uh, Deanna, sorry, Deanna put a link in the chat box too. The Wildlife Commission has a, a publication actually on coexisting with coyotes and they have some more information about just coyotes in general and their behavior. So you can look up, look up more on the website and see Wildlife Resources Commission. Yes, great. All right, well, how about we go back to snakes? Snakes and coyotes, okay. all right. Okay, so uh, Sandra saying that uh, her electrician found a snake skin in her attic a few days ago. So how do you keep snakes from coming into your house? Um, so I would say uh, there, there's several things you can do to discourage snakes from getting in your house or um, around, around your structure, building structures, that kind of thing in your attics. Um, the first thing is to try to reduce any prey resources. So uh, usually they're, they're looking for food. And so if they find mice or you know, squirrels or whatever it is that they happen to be eating, depending on the snake, um, if you can discourage any of those prey sources from your house or your property, then that's gonna help reduce snake issues. Um, obviously, if you can kind of keep a tidy yard, um, and by that, I mean, keep your grass trimmed relatively short, right around the house, keep build like a tree limbs or um, that kind of thing from brushing onto the side of your house or being close to the side of your house that they could climb up on and, and then get on your house or um, keep debris piles away, you know, kind of keep things uh, cleaned up a little bit then that's gonna also just discourage snakes from getting in there. Um, and then the biggest thing is just home maintenance. Uh, especially with older homes, it's very challenging to do, but try to fill all those cracks, use rubber seals, fill in holes, make sure the eaves are completely closed in, that kind of thing. And it's going to be harder, a lot harder for them to get in. I mean, they are ectothermic and if they can sense heat and they have a way to get in, then they're going to capitalize on that as far as trying to stay warm in the winter and things like that. So just uh, those are probably my biggest tips anyway on trying to keep, keep snakes out. Okay, and it looks like Deanna has posted the North Carolina Wildlife Commission. Uh, Deanna Noble is uh, behind the scenes there, who is also a wildlife biologist with the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission, and she's posted the uh, the link to uh, snakes in coexisting with snakes as well, so you can find that. So thanks, Deanna. Uh, one more on snakes. So how long do snakes typically live? I'm coming back, hang on. I just lost my screen there for a second. There you go. <laughs> I was like, you're muted, Kelly. <laughs> um, it depends, depends on the species. Um, you know, I would say anywhere from a couple of years to 15, depending on the species, kind of average, maybe seven or eight, unless they get predated upon. It really depends on the species and where they're located at, that kind of thing, so. Um, their, their biggest evolutionary advantage is to try to have, you know, a dozen or so hatchlings every year. And then those hatchlings, if, if you know, 2% of them live, then they've at least replaced themselves in, in the ecosystem. So uh, yeah, but maybe 10 years. Okay. All right, Karen, I, I don't think we have any more questions for you, but we do have lots of comments 
um, about folks being excited to maybe start looking at some of these more citizen science science projects and looking for opportunities to to provide some input in their observations. So I think you provided a lot of information there where somebody could find something that best suits their, um, maybe their interests. So that's great. Um, sounds like a lot of folks have learned several new things. But we do have something else in the chat where somebody asked about, let's see, April had asked about black widows, you know, just black widows always being near uh, pipes or garden hoses or just in small cre crevices, uh, any, um, any insight on black widow bites or, or how concerning that would be, or even how to get rid of black widows, keep them from forming a, a spider web. I don't know that there's much, much for that. Um, do you want to take that one, Karen, or? No, but I'd be interested in the answer as well. We've got several in the same areas in my house. <laughs> um, so I, I would say the biggest thing to do is some of the same things that you would normally do for snakes or anything else, you know, try to keep your house tidy, try to keep it clean. Um, if there's not a prey resource, so again, they're going after insects and things like that. Um, if you can cut down on that inside the house, uh, they will just naturally be out in the woods um, and they will naturally sometimes attach themselves to the side of your house or under your barns or um, whatever. I've, I actually got a longleaf pine cone from down in the sand hills one time and brought it home and, and uh, it had already opened, like it had already basically senesced and opened and, uh, but there was one hiding down in there and I didn't even know it. It was two days later, I found a little black widow on my, uh, on my mantle. And I was like, where did, oh, that's where you came from. <laughs> Um, so I just left it outside for a couple of days and it scurried off somewhere. So, um, really the biggest thing is, uh, I guess just general sanitation. I don't think there's really anything you can actually do other than using chemical repellents and things like that to actually keep them out of the house, you know. I'm sure you can find something on the internet. <laughs> yeah, spiders are, are kind of tricky. I guess we need a, a spider. Yeah. Yeah, the, the brown recluse though is is more rare than the black widow, but it has uh, it's more um, injurious and, and more fatal. So really, I would say um, if you're going to be concerned about one, be more concerned about the brown recluse. But then again, there's not as many of them out there, so you might not need to. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, okay, it, thank you, Kelly. Um, it looks like Jada, uh, Karen, Jada was trying to access the link for your handout and was saying it didn't necessarily go to that, but it looks like she was saying if you take the period off of the end of the link that you provided, it does look like it will. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we've got two different things here. Um, I guess maybe some folks are having trouble with the evaluation link at the end, Bob, did you see that? Yeah, comment? so if they're if they're copying uh, the link out of the chat and there was a period at the end of the sentence and that got copied with it, they need to remove that period. But I've reposted the link, so they should be able to just click on it directly in the chat and that will launch their browser in the survey. Okay, thank you. Um, I did see one uh, above, Karen, that folks were having trouble going to the link that you had posted. Let's see if I can find it here, that it was just taking them to the uh, Wildlife Commission's page, but maybe not a specific handout. Yeah, I was wondering if that might have been a, another link that had been put out there. So this one should go, I'll repost it. It should go to a, um, it's a, a Google Drive um, document. I shortened it to try to make it easier for folks to see. Okay. So I'll try it again. I'll also, try to get the direct link to it too. Jennifer, I just put a link in the chat too about um, from U University of Kentucky Entomology about discouraging spiders around her home. Okay. Great. So uh, check those out if you're still on. I forget who had that question, but. Spiders and kids, yeah, two things you're always concerned about. You just have to watch it. 
we get them a lot in our garage. And girls are messing around. Is that kids you get a lot in your garage or spiders? <laughs> I think I get a lot of those, <laughs> both spiders and kids. But uh, yeah, they, they love to, to see the spiders run when they move something. And at least they can identify them a little bit better than a, a brown recruit or recluse. So that's uh, all right. Well, so far, that's about all the questions we have. Let's see. So we got. Looks like we're getting one that says, I would like a sign that has a checklist of things that are okay to do on the land. So we have people in the lower acreage, four wheeling through the wetlands. Um, so is it okay to walk and observe? Maybe a good place for signs. Um, so I guess maybe uh, the question is just maybe they've got some folks that are run four wheelers through the properties and they just want to post some areas that um, folks to stay out of or maybe to, to warn them not to maybe take their four wheeler through. If it's a wetland, I mean, yeah, you really don't want the four wheelers going in there and just kind of riding around, around the creek and creating another channel or destroying the integrity of the channel or stream that's there but uh, maybe keep it to a, one small crossing that they could then work on some erosion and things. Um, but I'm not sure we have a sign. Let's see. Okay, it looks like uh, Anna just joined and she's got some questions about trespassing and things like that. So Anna, we're gonna definitely talk about that in our next webinar series. We'll be talking about posting the land uh, hunting leases and uh, just dealing with trespassing in general. So uh, those were great questions that maybe we can answer at the next presentation in April. We can talk more about that. Uh, when they were talking about people earlier though, Jennifer, we did post into the chat a link to a couple extension publications about okay. uh, land ownership and liability. And, okay. Uh, marking property boundaries. So I just reposted that in the chat so she can copy and paste that or click on those links for those publications. Okay, great. All right, so Anna, hopefully you've seen that. Um, looks like Bob's got a lot of information in there for you. Okay. All right, anybody yeah, else out there? I had put in the chat too. Sorry, Jen, there's a delay. I'm talking over you without even realizing it. Um, Linda put in the chat that no trespassing signs don't seem to do any good, four-wheeler people dump a deer, stuff like that. Um, the Really the biggest, um, you know, there, there is a Landowner Protection Act in North Carolina. Um, it's mo mostly for um, hunters and, and trappers and anglers to be able to use someone else's property, but with written permission only, um, so that before the law enforcement would have to basically issue a, an arrest warrant uh, to be able to cite somebody for a legal trespass after the fact versus this is now if they don't have written permission on them to use your property right then and there when the enforcement officer catches them then they can then write a citation on the spot so it does help with trespass there um, but part of that landowner protection act is also painting your property so the purple paint law in North Carolina is that's what people refer to it as and that's an easy way to actually paint your property boundaries instead of using signs because paint is a lot harder to remove than signs. Um, but that, like Jen said, we are gonna talk about that at our next, uh, one of our next webinars and the, it'll kind of cover a lot of that stuff about trespass and a lot. We're actually gonna have a wildlife enforcement officer come to give that talk, so. And there's a link, um, somebody put the link in the, in the chat box to that Landowner Protection Act, so. Yes, perfect. All right. All right. Well, we got a few more minutes. If anybody has any more questions, like we got about, uh, well, we've got about 26 folks still on. So we've lost most, most people. All right. Well, you ladies did a great job today. Thank you so much for the information. I think there's several things in there I could get my, uh, my children more involved in, Karen. And uh, my children get tired of, my husband is also a forester and, and they get tired of hearing us talk about things. 
outside and uh, talk about uh, what they call work. And so uh, we finally did the uh, backyard birding mm -hmm. and uh, they were excited about doing that and putting the things into the app. So that seems to be the way to, to at least get my two excited, I guess. <laughs> so Excellent. Maybe we'll try some of the other things. All right, yeah, Karen well. did a great job showing all the uh, variety of citizen science projects out there that there's pretty much anything under the sun if you're interested or your kids are interested in something. So I hope it's it a great way to get involved, especially little kids. So, Jennifer, you got a question in the Q&A. Okay, uh, let's see. Hi, Sally. Um, have we done a session on force and carbon sequestration? So that is, a, that is a good one. We have not specifically talked about uh, carbon sequestration, but we've done a lot. We've done the, I guess our first series was still when we were able to meet in person, we did do our, well, the first one, I guess, was just kind of creating a plan for your land, learning about your land and those kinds of things. And then the second in-person workshop we did, we did talk about force management, but, but uh you know, carbon sequestration is not something that we have really discussed yet. Obviously, that's a benefit of forest land. That's a benefit of, of promoting a, a healthy forest and, and the trees are actively growing. That means they're actively sequating that carbon from the atmosphere. But, um, but that's about as far as we've gone. So maybe we'll, we'll look into that, maybe find someone that's more versed on that. Great idea, though. Thank you, Sally. Okay. Yeah, I had a couple of landowners that were interested in carbon sequestration when I was doing habitat management a couple of years ago. So it might be a worthwhile topic to touch on at some point. Okay. Yeah, good idea, particularly if uh, some of the our carbon credits and things just really don't make it to, uh, to landowners, but maybe folks would be interested in somehow these larger companies and businesses are offsetting some things. Okay, we got one more from Anna. Um, she said uh, she just built a rocket box bat house and had learned a lot. And it was a great one that other folks may want to try. And it's in front of the house, so it's making a lot of good conversation about bats and, and myth busting. Some of the myths are about bats. So that's great to hear, Anna. And uh, those bat boxes are, are really neat. And folks always wanna know what, what can get in there. <laughs> All right, well, we are uh, coming to a close. And uh, we've got lots of links in the chats that folks can see and look at. And uh, other than that, ladies, any more questions? I guess that we've got about 20 folks on here. So for those that are uh, still on here, don't forget to, uh, to complete that survey link for us. Bob has posted the most recent link in there. And I think it'll take you to this link once you close the program as well. Is that right, Bob? It, it should, but let me just one more time, we'll uh, paste it in the chat and then you can uh, be able to go um, click on that and that will take you there and then you don't have to worry about if it launches or not. So just click on this link. And that should get you to the survey. All right, thank you so much. I did All right, see a well, question um, come up about children participating in programs, thinking citizen science wise. Um, I'm just gonna go back to the Eco Explorer program um, because they're actually kind of redesigning it right now. And um, it really is targeted to start at age five, um, but they're kind of having some different age groups and challenges. So they're trying to make it so kids can grow within the program. So you can start as early as five and it's really designed all the way to go up to kind of early high school. Awesome, great. Thank you, Karen. All right, well, if there's no further questions, thank you everyone for joining us. You did a great job. And uh, for those that are still listening, uh, we hope that you'll join us again in our April webinar. April 8th. All right. Thank you so much, everyone.